Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third panel in the Dana Dialogue series. Uh, for this panel, we will be talking about gut-brain interactions. And so your gut and your brain are constantly communicating. Um, and for this particular conversation, we'll eavesdrop into the conversation between your gut and brain to uncover the messages that are flowing between them. Um, just so everyone knows, uh, please use the question and answer box um, in Zoom for any questions that you have during the, uh, the panel. And we will also have uh, time at the end for more questions. Um, today, we are joined uh, by our panelists, um, Monica Deuce um, from the University of Michigan, uh, Valerie Darcy um, from the NIH, um, I'm so sorry, the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases at the NIH, um, and Christoph Thais um, from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, to start off, I would like to ask each speaker to share a bit about themselves and how they approach the topic of gut-brain interactions. Uh, Monica, I think we can start with you. Hi, everybody. My name is Monica. I am an associate professor at the University of Michigan, and my lab studies the effects of nutrients uh, on the body and the brain. Um, I just have to do a disclosure. Um, this year, I'm actually on leave from the university to work for the government, but I'm here today speaking to you in my personal capacity. Um, so everything I said is uh, just uh, about me. Um, so I'm really interested in thinking about nutrients uh, and as a form of communication. Um, and so rather than thinking about just how the brain or the gut communicate. I'm particularly interested in understanding how the nutrient themselves are carrying different messages to different parts of the body and the outcomes and results of that communication. And I study that communication with my lab, both at the very broad level, looking at the effects on behavior and at the very uh, specific down, small like level molecular um, and cellular so I'll happy to tell you more about that later. Um, and then Valerie. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Monica. Um, thanks, thanks, Tyler. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I am Valerie Darcy. I am a research fellow at, in the Laboratory of Biological Modeling at the National Institutes of Health, specifically the National Institute of Diabetes, and Digestive, and Kidney Diseases. Um, my doctorate is in neuroscience, but I'm also a registered dietitian. And so when I combine those two aspects of my training, um, it kind of informs the bigger picture of my work, which is to identify nutritional factors that do or don't support brain chemistry and brain function that's linked with our behaviors. And the behaviors that I'm specifically interested in are um, our habits and impulses and our ability to control them. So um, to do this, I use a variety of neuroimaging tools in human participants, like magnetic resonance imaging and spectroscopy to look at brain structure, brain function, and some neurochemistry. And I also use positron emission tomography, where by using a small amount of a labeled drug, we can look at brain chemistry and brain metabolism before and after changing a diet, for example. Um, so far, my work has shown that nutritional factors uh, related to the diet, like the quality and quantity of dietary fats, and factors related to individual, like body mass index, which is kind of roughly proportional to um, somebody's proportion of body fat, they're related to brain function and brain chemistry behind their behaviors. So just really briefly, I'll say that in healthy adolescents, I looked at how the amount of a nutrient that's essential to our diets, omega-3 fatty acids, um, which comes mostly from cold water seafood sources. Um, the content of this fatty acid, both in the adolescent diet and in their blood was linked to the structure and function of a part of the brain that controls their impulses, the prefrontal cortex, as well as their ability to control their impulses in real life. And then in adults, we found that individuals who have higher body mass index may have greater amounts of a neurotransmitter called dopamine at rest in a part of the brain that contributes to their habits. And that weight loss diets, specifically one that reduces calories just by cutting fat, 
um, appears to exacerbate this and also shift food choices in a way that um, promotes intake of food that's higher in sugar and fat. But as a dietitian, I'm also thinking about gut-brain interactions in terms of their potential for clinical utility in behavioral medicine. How can we manipulate brain chemistry um, for clinical conditions where patients really need to sustain a behavioral change to improve their health? Yes, making long-term weight management easier, of course, but also to support behavioral change needed for lifelong recovery from conditions like drug and alcohol misuse. And Christoph, who will end with you. Thanks, Tyler. I really appreciate the chance to be here today. And uh, my, my research group at the University of Pennsylvania is very interested in gut-brain interactions from the perspective of the microbiome, which is the, the community of microorganisms that lives in the GI tract. And I was actually originally trained as an immunologist um, at a time when immunology was uh, very appealing to me because of its very strong potential for uh, causal um, interventions, causal experiments. I very consciously chose this, uh, you know, as, a, as an undergraduate, I was, I was very interested in exploring immunology because it felt very applicable to many different diseases, but also experimentally, it felt very attractable at the time. And one of the biggest questions at the time in immunology was how the body can distinguish between pathogenic bacteria and commensal bacteria, because there are so many bacteria that live inside and on the human body, um, essentially from the moment we're born um, and throughout our entire lives, while at the same time, the immune system needs to retain the ability to fight infections. So a very big unresolved question at the time, and to some extent still unresolved today, was how the immune system makes this distinction. And this question got me very interested in studying the microbiome, and I ended up studying the microbiome not only in its in the context of its immune functions, but also in the context of its metabolic functions. And when I started my own lab at the University of Pennsylvania a couple of years ago, we realized that many of the microbiome functions or the gastrointestinal functions in general are um, mediated by the nervous system, both the peripheral and the central nervous system. So that's how we got interested in understanding what the signals are by which the microbiome, the molecules that the microbiome produces, and the GI tract in general, signal to the nervous system and how the nervous system sort of integrates um, signals from the GI tract into regulation of physiology, regulation of uh, immune system function and regulation of metabolism in general. So that's how I, I got to studying uh, what, uh, what my lab studies today. And I'm, I'm uh, very excited about this discussion today. Thank you all. Um, I think uh, for the first question, I would like to ask, um, Monica, um, if you could tell us a little bit more about um, kind of how you think of uh, the gut-brain interactions more of as a sensory system to decode food messages. Yeah, I'd love to. So uh, I mentioned in my introduction that I really, um, I really think of this sensing of nutrients as a form of communication. And in every basic communication, the basic elements are the messenger, the receiver, the medium in which the message is communicated, and then the message. And so um, in my lab, we try to focus on all those different parts. So how it's communicated would be the medium, and that could be neurons in the brain, in the gut, microbiome, um, hormones, neurotransmitters, different aspects of it. And then the what is communicated, or the, mess the messenger, what it's communicating is the nutrients and the receiver is different parts of the body. And so you already are very familiar with one form of nutrient communication, which is essentially your taste. Um, when we taste sweet, for example, um, it's, it's not just delicious, it's also a measure for our bodies and our brains to know that we have ingested something that's highly caloric because sweetness is correlated with the amount of simple carbohydrates. Same thing for saltiness, it's more than just also really tasty. Uh, it essentially is a proxy for the amount of sodium 
that's in the food, which is an essential nutrient. You can go on, think about umami or savoriness, which essentially is communicating the amount of amino acid depending on the intensity. And so that that all that nutrient sensing is happening on the outside of the body. So the body is able to, the brain and the body is able to make a prediction, you know, if this, this sweet, um, it will have, you know, this much sugar, but as we know from drinking diet soda, uh, your your mouth and that sense can be fooled because diet soda tastes delicious and it's sweet, but has no calories. And so it's important that there are additional nutrient sensing systems that are really keeping track, not just, uh, not just of those elements that can serve as cues to tell about the nutrients, but actually how many amino acids, how much sugar, is in there. And this system of sensing um, is internal. It, um, it is present in most cells. There are many elements. Uh, it can be direct by directly sensing how much of the nutrient there is. It can be indirect by having a receptor um, transport the nutrient into the cell, the cell responding with the secretion of a hormone, for example, like insulin. And it can be both very, uh, it can be very molecular where the nutrient itself can either directly turn on or turn off or facilitate genetic switches within your DNA. So kind of tinker with the ability of cells to respond to the nutrient, or it can be very broad. And instead of affecting something at the DNA level, it can affect uh, a specific neural circuits or many different neural circuits in the brain, or it can even affect an alien that is part of you, like the microbiome. And so there are nutrients that we ourselves cannot break down, but thanks to the legion of microorganisms that in our, inhabit our gut, we essentially, we are food for them. We provide them food and then the byproduct of the food can create things like neurotransmitters that can potentially affect our mood, but they can also provide different breakdown products like short chain fatty acids that can have beneficial effects for other parts of our bodies, like the livers or the gut. And so that's a way of like sort of rethinking the way we consider nutrients as more than something that our body needs or building block or, you know, just calories that will end up in as being burned, but as a sort of like sort of um, information that the body is tracking externally and internally in order to adapt itself to this changing environment. Thank you, Monica. And Monica, you mentioned um, in your answer uh, the alien inside of us as our microbiome. Um, and I'll actually, I'll just ask Christoph this. Um, could you uh, talk a bit more about um, the microbiome and how the microbiome uh, may impact um, uh, the signals that we can get from our GI tract into our brains? Sure, yeah. So the microbiome in general is essentially a very large microbial community that lives inside every one of us. Um, it's composed of bacteria, but also viruses that um, infect those bacteria and infect the host cells. Um, there is also a large range of parasites, um, eukaryotic and multicellular parasites. Um, and then there is a, a fungal community as well. So it's a very rich microbial community. Um, the estimate is that there are as many microbial cells in the GI tract as uh, human cells in the human body. Um, and when we talk about the, the genetic coding capacity, the collective genomes of these microorganisms is actually much larger than our own human genome. And over the last, I would say, 20 years, we have learned a lot about what these different microorganisms do. We know for at least 100 years that, that there are bacteria in the GI tract, and we know that they help us uh, digest food. Um, but as Monica just mentioned, they, they do a lot more than just this. There are actually many, many signals produced by these microorganisms. And these signals are, you know, they have many local effects in the gastrointestinal tract, but it goes even beyond the gastrointestinal tract. We now know that um, many of the functions of uh, mammalian organisms, like human beings, are affected by these signals. Um, for example, metabolic functions, immune system functions, and, and even functions of the nervous system. So it just, uh, we, we have learned that in a way, we we um, have ignored the uh, the function of the GI tract as an endocrine system, which is largely contributed by signals coming from these microorganisms. 
and it just uh, ties in very nicely to what Monica just described as uh, basically a signaling hub that communicates between the outside of the body and the inside because there are so many environmental signals, especially dietary signals that the microbiome takes and it integrates and it um, literally digests these signals for the host and then influences host physiology in many different ways. Thank you. And so it, it seems like there is uh, a lot more going on uh, in our gut and in these interactions than just what we eat and it going straight to our brain. Um, Valerie, could you uh, talk more to how uh, this kind of wide network of communication uh, can impact and add in challenges to kind of studying this messaging system, especially like in uh, in humans. Yeah, that's a good point, Tyler. Um, all of the work that the teams in Monica and Christoph's lab do very elegant, beautiful, mechanistic work. I do work in humans um, as basic as we can get. Um, but one big challenge is that the Research is inherently reductionist by nature. We take very complex, and this is true of most uh, rigorous science, we take very complex uh, phenomena and break it down into very simple parts. And by studying those individual parts, we run the risk of when you take that isolated component and put it back into the whole system to see if it will produce the intended effect, it may or may not hold up. So take the two main sides of this research coin, why we consume food, and what the foods we are consuming are doing in the brain. Well, why do we eat? What are the drivers? Humans eat for a number of reasons beyond just meeting our energy needs and being hungry. We eat because it's pleasurable, because it's social, because the food is just there. And to know how to change our diets to affect our neurochemistry, we really have to understand the mechanisms of what's going on, which means we often have to isolate single foods or nutrients to study in often artificial laboratory research situations um, that's largely separate from why we eat. And this is true of many of the animal work, animal, animal studies and many human studies, including the work that I do at the moment. So for my current work, my team provides all of the food that we want participants to consume. And in these inpatient controlled feeding studies, as we call them, the diets will be tweaked in very specific ways where we can be sure of what and when the participants are eating. Um, and that the only thing changing in each diet condition is the component that we're interested in. The benefit of doing this work in humans is that it's directly relevant to, to us as humans, but to under, get to understand the specific pathways and mechanisms, we really need to look to complementary animal work to take advantage of its precision, um, like the elegant work being done um, in my colleagues' labs here. But even when we isolate a single component, though, I wanted to mention, there really can be challenges in, in um, study designs and interpretation of the results sometimes. So think about the challenges in isolating a specific, uh, an effect of a specific nutrient, because at least in nutrition research, when you change the proportion of factor A in the diet, oftentimes the proportion of another component, factor B, also changes too. And then without rigorous controls, if the study isn't well designed, is it really the manipulation in factor A uh, or the commensurate change in factor B that has caused your effect. And unlike testing pharmaceuticals, for instance, um, where levels of a drug in someone's system are at zero before they start taking the drug, humans, animals, we eat every day. And so our background exposure to whatever nutrient we're trying to manipulate um, is already there. So considering somebody's background nutritional status um, as a starting point can be a really important consideration and in interpreting results um about why they came out the way they did so just because we're reducing uh to study a specific aspect of the diet um, we should also ultimately keep in mind that this is all really cyclic in nature because what we can eat or what we uh what we eat can influence the why of eating um, our susceptibility for instance to eating in response to a driver of food intake like cues in our environment so those are the big challenges that I see, um, especially with respect to human nutrition research and brain imaging research. And um, you mentioned taking the uh, person's uh, nutritional uh, status um, in a, into account when doing these um, studies. Are there also ways to take in different um, kind of neurological statuses? statuses? So like um, 
especially like uh, like neurodivergent patients uh, and uh, like maybe people who have lower or more like neurotransmitter levels than uh, standard? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So um, maybe one day in the future, we'll be able to have a you know neurochemical profile at screening when we are trying to enroll people into a study to test the outcome of, uh, or to test the effect of a particular diet on neurochemistry. But at this point, we basically, uh, at our screening visits, will ask about somebody's neurological and also psychiatric history, and it's by self-report at this time. Um, it will, um, and unfortunately, the way our studies are designed, in order to see, um, to make sure the effect that we're uh, trying to observe is due to um, the diet manipulation of interest. We oftentimes try to recruit as um, homogeneous a sample as possible, like make people as uh, uh, similar as possible so that we can see a signal from the diet manipulation that we're trying to, trying to put in. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Um, I think we can, I want to change focus a little bit um, on uh, onto some of these um, external and internal um, factors that could be, what am I trying to say? What am I saying? That could be um, looked at uh, through these uh, gut-brain interactions. Um, and so, Christoph, I would like to ask, um, um, when looking at sort of gut-brain interactions and um, also like the microbiome and looking at how they can impact um, the brain and how it is um, sort of cl classified. Um, how can sort of these uh, gut-brain interactions uh, impact sort of these neurocognitive or uh, behavioral or degenerative um, uh, kind of brain afflictions? And this is actually a question I think that um, all of our panelists could uh, answer. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to go first. Um, I'll just make one one general remark, um, which which is very relevant um, when it comes to your question of how we compare external and internal factors that are being sensed, um, because we we very generally distinguish between exteroception and interoception as two major principles. Which, with exteroception being everything that our body senses in the environment, and interoception everything that our body senses within the body, essentially. And, and uh, exteroception has been studied for much longer. Um, our, our level of knowledge there is much, much deeper. We, we know um, really well what goes on chemically and molecularly when we're talking about the, the, you know, the common exteroceptive senses, for example, our, our, our ability to taste things, our ability to hear things, our ability to see things, um, our sense of touch, and so on. There we, we have a very good understanding of uh, what happens by physically and molecularly, for example, when when uh, our fingers touch something or when there is a, um, you know, a, a piece of food that touches our tongue or when we hear sound. Um, and usually generally this works is that there is a, a two component system for the most part. There is a neuronal cell and just above the neuronal cell is a non-neuronal cell, usually a type of epithelial cell. And the epithelial cell does the sensing. For example, in the skin, there are touch sensitive cells and they will then communicate to the neuron. The same is true in the retina in the eye and the same is true um, in the tongue and the same is true in the ear. Um, and, and in each of these cases, the, the, the neuronal cell then picks up the signal and sends it to the brain and the brain interprets what we just felt essentially. Now, when it comes to interoception, um, we don't know how many different senses there are. Um, we don't know how many variables are being measured in our bodies all the time. We don't know, um, you know how, if we can classify this um, in the same way as we currently do for the exteroceptive system. We do know that there are some commonalities. For example, this theme of a neuronal cell just being placed below an epithelial cell is, is definitely true in the gastrointestinal tract. There are many examples of epithelial cells releasing signals to neurons, and these neurons then transporting the signal to the brain, and the brain then interprets um, the signal accordingly. One very big distinction that we know of is that all of our exteroceptive senses are conscious, right? For example, if I if I uh, make a sound, it's very hard for everybody not to focus on the sound. In fact, it's almost impossible not to consciously perceive the sound. 
And at the same time, for our internal senses, um, they are largely non-conscious. Um, we can, just to go back to an example that, uh, that Monica mentioned earlier, if we're trying to count the, the glucose molecules or, the, or other um, nutrients in our, in our GI tract, and we focus very hard, we're, we're not able to do this, where it's, it basically invades our, uh, our conscious perception. We, even if we focus extremely hard, there's no way we can, we can gain um, conscious access to these senses. So for a long time, it was thought that th this is a, a general distinction between exteroceptive senses and, and interoceptive senses. But it's not entirely true because there are certainly internal sensations that are very conscious. For example, when our bladder is full, this is something we, we feel very strongly. Or, or when we're nauseous, we feel it very strongly when, when our GI tract gets uh, distended because we, uh, we ate too much. This is extremely conscious. So, so the, the more updated version to how we think about this currently is that um, there are two main uh, types of neurons that mediate this uh, interoceptive sensing. Um, one of these neurons is the vagus nerve, all the neurons that belong to the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve innervates many of the tissues in the in the body, including the gastrointestinal tract, but also many others. And signals coming through the vagus nerve are largely um, not conscious. But there is a second system, which are the sensory neurons that run along the spinal cord. And these also innervate many of the different tissues in the body, including the gastrointestinal tract. And they also report signals to the to the brain. Um, and according to a lot of recent work, including from uh, from the lab of Ivan de Arujo, we think that uh, these spinal afferents are are more accessible to consciousness. Probably there is not a, a very clear cut distinction, but I think largely we can say that these uh, vagal and spinal systems make up the interoceptive system that we have in our body. And certainly the vagal sensations are um, not accessible to conscious perception. In fact, it's actually pretty interesting. There are a few conditions where uh, vagus nerve stimulation is is applied in humans and people with vagus nerve stimulation they they often report sort of a general non-localized change in their feelings or in their mood and it's very hard for them to to know exactly where it comes from which i think is because the the vagus nerve doesn't give us a sense of location and and doesn't um immediately access the conscious perception but it sort of generally changes our um our interpretation of these feelings. Um, so that, that that's just uh, as a general background of, of exteroceptive and interoceptive systems. But the reason why I bring it up is because, um, and this also goes back to to uh, points that both Valerie and Monica raised earlier. When we're eating something, basically there is a cascade of sensory events that the that the food item triggers that can be interpreted as both exteroceptive and interoceptive. Because, for example, when we when we have a piece of food in our hand. First, we smell it, right? This is clearly extra-receptive. And this is, in, in a way, this is a, a quality control mechanism because if it smells bad, we will not go ahead and, and eat a piece of food. And then when we have it in our mouth, so if it smells good or it, or it doesn't smell, um, and we, we proceed with ingestion, then we have it in our mouth. And then there is uh, basically another extra-receptive sense, which is the, the sense of taste, which, uh, as, as Monica mentioned earlier, it tells us about the qualities of the food. And again, if it doesn't taste good, we usually spit it out and we don't go ahead and swallow it. So there's basically a second layer of extra-receptive control. But then the interesting thing is once we swallow it, it would sort of enter the realm of uh, interception in a way. And from then on, it's much less conscious, um, but we still have all these sensory events, right? There is still um, intestinal epithelial cells that uh, sense nutrients coming from the food. Um, and and you know there are there are many specialized sensory cells in the gastrointestinal tract that will then access the different uh, properties of the food, and again report it to neurons, um, for example, of the vagus nerve that will then send a signal to the brain. So in a way, there is so food basically um, passes along the entire gradient of extraceptive and interoceptive senses. And I think what's very important is that some of these um, qualities of food are extremely conscious. Like we know immediately if uh, food smells bad or if it smells good, and we know immediately how it tastes to us. But I think um, the, the, what, what uh, plays a very big role in our decision whether to eat more of a specific food is actually not conscious because it's transmitted to the brain through the vagus nerve and some of these uh, other interoceptive senses. 
and they molecularly they might function very similarly they they um, evaluate specific uh, nutrients in the food they evaluate the caloric content and many other features of the food but they they influence um, our decision making and our eating behavior through a completely different uh, neural perceptive system and i think that's what's what's also very interesting about valerie's work is to try and understand where these decisions come from and and how they influence brain activity and brain function in ways that are very different compared to what we normally perceive as the common um, sensory abilities of the human body. Oh, so you mentioned um, sort of the uh, the external stuff there, so the external um, sensory uh, experience of food and the in terms of the, so the internal experience of food. Um, from that, I actually have a question for uh, uh, Valerie and Monica on um, sort of how their work works within that um, extero and interoceptive um, field. Um, I specifically do have a question on um, how could we look, how does, how do you look into sort of gut brain interactions when um, sort of parts of that communication are disrupted, such as with um, like anosmia. So people who have a, um, a low or no sense of smell, um, whereas smell um, greatly impacts taste, which is a very large exteroceptive um, feature of, you know, of eating. It, one of, I think the best, features of eating is being able to actually, you know, taste the food. Um, and so either Monica or Valerie, if you could speak to how you sort of look into uh, disruptors of those um, communication signals. You want to start, Monica? <laughs> um, well, I don't, I don't, I can't speak to the um, anosmia uh, feature and how that might be, um, how that might influence um, brain neurochemistry or response to food manipulation. Um, but one thing that really excites me going forward is now the burgeoning interest in how um, modernization of our food supply um, in terms of uh, the levels of processing in the food, specifically, um, manipulating food in a way that uh, makes it ultra processed by adding uh, certain components that we can't necessarily add in our home kitchens. Um, and um, on top of that, um, not just ultra processing of food, but also specifically um, stripping the mm, pleasurable, like known pleasurable components of food, the fat, the sugar, the salt, and combine them in ways that we haven't really seen before historically um, to kind of almost supercharge the palatability, make them hyper palatable, if you will, um, in terms of their uh, in terms of in terms of their qualities. So what I'm really excited to see going forward with my own work and um, with work of colleagues uh, is to figure out how that sensory mismatch, these foods that are engineered to be um, like replicas of what we have in our natural food supply, but um, obviously their caloric content and their nutrient content is way different than what we can assemble um, based on actual actual food content. Um, how that will play out in terms of, in my work, neurochemistry, and um, if it if it will look like the um, neurochemical signature of something that um, a substance that might drive repeated intake um, or not. So we'll, we'll see the evidence um, isn't there, isn't there yet um, with respect to that. But um, yeah, I wonder if Monica has other things to add for that. Yeah, sort of um, building on that um, and thinking about uh, kind of go, thinking about how essentially the food we eat affects us and our brains. So um, maybe I'll bring it back to a concrete example uh, that uh, my lab and other labs um, research, which is the effects of our diet on taste. So 
you know, we we are genetically programmed to be able to sense and also like and dislike some things over others. There's a reason why a cupcake is just better to eat than a plate of broccoli, um, especially if you know you um, you are a toddler and you haven't learned that broccoli broccoli are good for you. So we are genetically programmed to like some things over others, and then part of the program that was like kind of like chronicle in our gene through the evolutionary experiences of our predecessors um, is edited or shaped by early life experiences with the diet. And that's both our own life experiences and that of our um, uh, um, mothers who essentially, so when the mother is carrying the fetus, uh, what the mother is eating, it's also going into the fetus and the developing taste buds. And so there are um, the studies that have shown that essentially some preference are formed uh, depending on what the mother was eating while the baby was developing or during breastfeeding. And there are also um, other really beautiful studies by uh, Julie Manella and, and other labs that essentially have looked at the type of baby formula that uh, babies are eating and how that affects acceptance for different kinds of food like and food quality, like sourness or sweetness. And um, uh, Dean, De Christina, Mariette, yeah, I, I've read a few uh, conversation articles about this, a really short read. So I'm happy to link them or you can link them. But so, so we are born with some, with a genetic predisposition. This genetic predisposition is shaped by our early life experience, by development. And then we get to adulthood where we get to decide what we eat um, and um, what we eat also shapes uh, those uh, those sensations. And so one thing that my lab has looked at and others is, for example, how dietary sweetness, how much sugar um, and other labs have looked at how much sodium or saltiness is in the diet affects your ability um, organisms and including humans ability to sense those taste qualities. So there are studies that have looked at decreasing the amount of sugar um, or salt in humans and have found that actually humans uh, then over time slowly develop an enhanced um, uh, sensation of those two qualities. Um, and there are studies now trying to look at whether higher sugar essentially desensitizes the taste system. And the studies of my lab and others in fruit flies and rats have shown that higher sugar actually does desensitize the taste system. Um, and again, I wrote a, a conversation article, it's a five minute read all about uh, how the taste system is shaped by what we eat. Now, of course that might have an impact on what we eat, uh, in turn, because if say you your bliss point, your preferred levels of sweetness now might change, right? So that's one hypothesis. But another uh, another possibility, going back to what Valerie was saying, is that now uh, what what your prediction that from the mouth, the external system that Christoph was talking about, the internal system, actually how many nutrients are there is mismatch right? Maybe you are now eating a cupcake and it doesn't feel as sweet because you eat cupcake all the time. And so your, your mouth is telling your brain that you're eating something that's as sweet as a carrot. But, you know, within a little bit of time when your body actually gets flooded with all the buttery sugarness, it's like your brain was like, oh my God, this is a cupcake. It's a carrot cake. It's not a a carrot. And so that has a really big impact on your reward salience, on the, your reward system and the saliency you get. And so that mismatch very much like Valerie was saying, that can throw off essentially our ability to predict how much we should eat, uh, which is already hard because like Christoph said, there are so many subconscious mechanisms that go on. And so part of the sensory system is kind of compromised. And so this is kind of a very specific example of how a really unique and important ability of the sensory system, which is the ability to tune itself to a wide range 
of concentration of essential nutrients actually might eventually work against you when you have a lot of the nutrients or might work in favor of you finding more of the nutrients because when you don't have enough, then the intensity of the sensation is increased. So you're like, oh, now you can find, you know, five molecules of sugar that's completely made up, but you can find a much lower amount. And so it's like this trade-off um, between something that's really important for a neuron and a nervous system, which is adaptability and, you know, the on the effects on the organism and that maybe Valerie you have to say more in terms of like you know more uh, other types of food and what it means for like humans do we where do we want to go Tyler should we no you on that <laughs> <laughs> um I just just a yes I completely agree with uh, everything Monica and Christoph have said so far. Um, and on top of uh, that, you know, the, the preference change um, based on uh, changing somebody's sensitivity to sweet foods um, and the desire to get more and more of those foods, those foods necessarily uh, oftentimes don't have the nutritional composition to support our optimal health. So they're going to be low in terms of um, nutrient density. They might be high in calorie density or energy density. So they'll promote, um, you know, they'll add to our uh, caloric intake, but they won't necessarily come with, those calories won't necessarily come with the nutrients that will support our overall health, the health of our other organs, liver, pancreas, heart, and of course our brain. So um, even aside from um, does this food influence um, our behavior? Does this food also contain the nutrients to support the optimal function of the tissues in my body, including including the brain? So there's like this uh, um, kind of almost an insidious, um, doubly insidious uh, uh, aspect of um, training, having our taste buds being trained to prefer um, the foods that don't um, necessarily, they give us pleasure, um, but they don't, they may not necessarily come with the nutrients that, to support our overall wellness and health. So. Thank you. And with that, we'll go to some of the um, uh, audience questions. Um, and so the first one that we will uh, talk about, um, ask about the mechanisms involved sort of in informing um, the brain on uh, nutrient consumption. Uh, this question specifically asks about um, what mechanisms might be involved in informing the brain uh, that I've consumed uh, too much fat or difficult to digest foods so that the gut can prepare appropriately to produce more digestive enzymes or otherwise make the uh, appropriate uh, digestive preparations. Well, I mean, um when fat is sensed in the mouth and in the gut, um, there are peripheral organs, um, a chain of events that eventually results in bile uh, production to help facilitate the absorption of, of the fat at the, you know, in the periphery. And um, I know that fat is, as a, as a nutrient, um, is sensed via the vagus nerve, as Christoph was, was mentioning, and the beautiful mechanistic animal work that's been done um, in uh, Dr. DeRujo's lab. Um, but I wonder also if uh, there's maybe some microbiome uh, responses to the amount of fat. Um, the microbiome produces short chain fatty acids, but do they respond also to the maybe amount or quality of dietary fat coming in? Um, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I think we have an expert uh, on the panel that might know the answer. Yeah, I want to uh, to highlight one very important cell type in this context, which is uh, a type of intestinal epithelial cell called enterendocrine cell. And these enterendocrine cells, they essentially they populate the small intestine and the large intestine, and they're relatively rare compared compared to other cell types in the gut. But they are extremely important in their ability to perceive specific items from food, for example, uh, dietary fat. And the reason why these enterendocrine cells are so important is because they produce um, different hormones 
that then signal to the brain and to other tissues in the body um, that food needs to be digested or that uh, ingestion of food needs to be stopped or that uh, the GI tract is too distended and, and uh, less food should come down the gastrointestinal tract. And these, these hormones, some of these hormones are actually pretty famous by now. They're called uh, GLP-1, for example, um, and CCK, which stands for cholecystokinin. And the reason why they're so famous is because we understand these systems so well now that we can target them with drugs. Um, for example, GLP-1, um, the, the GLP-1 system has given rise to some of the most commonly used weight loss drugs now. Um, for example, uh, um, semaglutide, which is basically a GLP-1 receptor agonist. So it, it tries to mimic the activity of this GLP-1. And so, in, you know, at, at the first impression is that GLP-1 is basically a satiety hormone which tells our body that we can stop eating. So if we give semaglutide or some of these other drugs, then it, uh, it essentially mimics the feeling of being full. And that's why we're less hungry, we eat less and we lose weight over time. But at the same time, GLP-1 also indicates that there are problems with digesting food and that we need to stop eating for other reasons. And that's why um, either because we're too full or because there are other problems with digestion, and that's why some of these GLP-1 drugs, they have side effects. And in some people, they cause nausea, they cause uh, vomiting in extreme cases, um, because it's essentially the, the physiological gradient of what GLP-1 does, of uh, telling us to stop eating, to telling us uh, now there is an emergency and we really need to stop eating, which is usually achieved by, by adverse feelings like nausea and vomiting. Um, but this, I think the, the reason why this is a, is a really good answer is because some of these systems if we understand them well from a basic science perspective, they can tell us how we can manage things like obesity in the clinic. And there are many more such mechanisms to be discovered. GLP-1 is only one example of these hormones that are released by endoendocrine cells in response to food. And, and there are many, many others that remain to be discovered. Um, and we have a question in our chat that I think um, may stem off of uh, sort of this, uh, conversation about um, uh, the signaling for uh, not eating or signaling of maybe um, satiety to the point of uh, pain or discomfort. Um, and the question asks um, about the link between our gut and um, migraines and uh, if there may be a causal link towards um, what we're eating, or at least how our gut is um, uh, interacting with the rest of our nervous systems and um, feeling the impacts of those in our brains manifested as a migraine. And that could be for um, any of our panelists. Um, I think I'll ask Christoph first, since you uh, just finished talking about some of these other uh, indicators. Yes, I, I haven't um, encountered any example in the literature where uh, the perception of food or, or uh, um, food-induced discomfort directly leads to migraine. Um, migraine, as far as we understand it, is uh, often caused by, by another neurochemical in the brain, um, which is called GCRP. And there is actually, this, this specific chemical is also present in the GI tract and it plays many different roles there. Um, so there, it's possible that there is some sensory connection that specifically relates to, relates to this one neurochemical where um, basically a GI dysregulation of this, of this uh, CGRP peptide may also involve CGRP dysfunction in the brain, which may then um, lead to, to the, basically the chronic pain that we usually experience in migraines. Um, but maybe Valerie can speak to a more clinical example of uh, potentially literature that I'm not aware of where, where this uh, connection has been made. Yeah, I, I'm actually, um, I'm not an expert in, in migraine, uh, unfortunately, so I can't um, expand much more beyond that. Um, but there, I mean, at a, at a basic level, um, when even just uh, whether there's food in the gut or not, so having been fed or fasting um, can influence um, the blood flow to the brain um, and um, the the vasodilation and vasoconstriction of vessels in the, in the brain, which can influence pressure, uh, the sensation of pressure in the brain. So um, there might be something to uh, the the connection there between um, uh, you know time since last meal, ha 
how, how fasted somebody is and um, the degree to which they can per they perceive uh, a migraine. But um, yeah, I, I'd have to look more into that to learn more. I wonder if the um, um, listener was asking about like head migraines or gun migraines. Um, and again, I don't know much about it, but we have a second brain in our gut. Uh, there are millions of neural cells, like we've been talking about for the last 20 minutes or so, that are in our gut. And our gut also produces, uh, I mean, I think most people are familiar with uh, serotonin. It's a neurotransmitter. And um, serotonin is also produced in the gut, actually, um, most, but not by neurons, but most serotonin in our bodies actually is from the gut. So you might think about, uh, you know, there are also other neurotransmitters that make us get allergies. And maybe, Christoph, you can talk about some of the gut sensitivities and um, the uh, the barrier between uh, the the gut and uh, and 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 the outside and what happens like if it become perforated um, or if there's leakiness and how that can create conditions that might uh, predispose people to inflammation allergies. I don't know much about it, but I know that there's a lot of research. But one thing to keep in mind is that yeah, there is a second brain. It's in our gut and uh, you know, sensitivities to that second brain can trigger essentially a gut migraine, but it's not in your head. It's just, you feel sick to your belly. Yeah, I'll make one very brief remark about food allergies because you brought it up, um, which I think is extremely interesting in the context of this entire discussion because food allergies are essentially um, manifestations of when this this food quality control system that we talked about earlier, when this breaks down um, and when this basically becomes dysfunctional in the sense that we respond to, to food components as if they were um, pathogenic microbes, right? We develop an immune response against them. It's actually not entirely clear why this happens and why it happens in some people and not in others. Um, but we do know that it's often associated with essentially the misrecognition of food elements, um, which, uh, seems to be more prevalent in some foods like peanuts than other foods. So there is definitely something about the food that leads to this quality, but it's not entirely clear what the initial sensation event is that goes wrong. Um, very likely it involves um, either a concomitant viral infection or another microbial infection, or as you mentioned, uh, Monica, a, a breach in the gastrointestinal barrier, which then leads to this basically immunological misrecognition of food. Um, by by uh, an arm of the immune system that we call type 2 immunity, which is usually um, used for uh, um, expulsion reactions. For example, if we have a parasite in the gut and we try to get rid of it, then we use type 2 immunity to achieve this. Um, but in the context of food allergy, this arm of the immune system is engaged against food. And then we essentially have a very similar reaction as we would normally have to a pathogen. Um, but we have it against food, and then this leads to all the manifestations of uh, this type 2 immune response in the gastrointestinal tract and in severe cases, even systemically. So I think understanding all these mechanisms that we talked about today in terms of food recognition and signaling to the brain um, will not only help us um, in the context of food preferences, um, obesity and diabetes and associated diseases, but it may actually help us in immunological diseases like, like allergy and asthma and other things as well. Thank you. And we are coming close to time. Um, I would like to end um, this section on for a, one last question to all of our speakers on what is one thing you would like the audience to take away from this conversation? Um, and we will start with Valerie. Um, that, let's see, that, I mean, I don't think anyone would dispute uh, that diet has a role in the health of our heart, um, our cardiovascular system, our liver, our pancreas. Um, I want people to also think about that, you know, some people optimize what they eat or uh, change what they eat in order to um, influence their heart health or um, maybe m mitigate or decrease their risk of type two diabetes. Um, I think 
the goal of my work and that of uh, some of my colleagues is to amass enough uh, evidence um, either for or against uh, some foods or dietary patterns that might also um, amount to a dietary approach to managing our behavior. And so that can be something in the future we can look forward to. And that um, all this to say, uh, we're coming up to the holidays. And while I, yes, as a dietitian, uh, will promote fruits and vegetables uh, until I'm blue in the face, I like to also remind people that, um, like I said in the beginning, we don't eat just because we're hungry. Um, I, we optimize physical health with diet, but not at the expense of, of mental health. Um, we have so social activities coming up where there'll be food involved. Um, you know, make, make mindful choices about um, filling your plate with things that are going to promote your health. Yes, but don't. Um, we see the danger coming from restricting um, re restricting intake of the, the really tasty stuff. Um, then it just leads to uh, increased incentive salience. As we talked about earlier, we just want it more and then it might become uh, a, a, an issue down the line. So um, optimize both physical and, uh, and mental health, uh, especially with the holiday season ahead. Thank you. Uh, and then I think we'll go to Christoph. Okay, so one, one last point that I want to make is that many of these mechanisms we discussed today in the context of food, um, and they, they may have clearly evolved in order for the organism to deal with food, but many of these uh, mechanisms may have implications way beyond our food recognition system. There is actually now um, uh, sort of a new class of disorders that, that, that has been classified as disorders of gut-brain interaction, and they in, involve things that uh, have previously been referred to as, as functional gastrointestinal disorders, for example, irritable bowel syndrome. So it's possible that um, sort of the misengagement or the misfunction of some of these mechanisms that have evolved as food sensory mechanisms may be involved in pain syndromes, um, functional disorders, and, and other manifestations of GI, um, GI diseases. So that's, that's one point I want to, that I want to raise. The other one is that it may go even beyond classical gastrointestinal disorders. Um, for example, my lab is, is very interested in understanding the role of gut-brain interaction in the context of long COVID, which is um, you know, which has many components of functional disorders, but is clearly triggered uh, by a viral infection. And our recent work has shown that, that there is a, a strong in, uh, involvement of the vagus nerve or vagal dysfunction in some of the neurocognitive manifestations of long COVID. So I think what I what I would want the listeners to take away from this conversation is that this is this is an extremely important um, component of of how the body works in terms of recognizing food components and regulating our food choices but it may go far beyond just uh, the regulation of food intake and it may be involved in in many other different manifestations of uh, diseases of the gastrointestinal tract and beyond i guess i'll take it home <laughs> so i think um, what I would like people to take away is that eating is no piece of cake, pun entirely intended. Um, we cover many of the different systems that uh, are work, and we also didn't get to cover all the other zillion ones that are also at work. And so in many ways, it uh, becomes an impossible task not just to know what to do, but to have the bandwidth to know what to do. All of us are caregivers, we have, we volunteer, we have jobs. And, and so there, like, like Valerie said, there's a lot more to eating than just substance. It's culture, it's friendship, it's, it's spending time, you know, with your family, your tradition, your history. Um, and, um, and, and in many ways, we kind of already know um, the sort of, we already know what we should be eating to try to extend our uh, well-being. And one part of that is try to minimize processed foods, try to have vegetables, uh, limit simple sugars. So things we know that are linked with a higher risk of uh, cardiovascular disease and uh, diabetes. Um, and I think, so at the end, since eating is so hard, it it takes 
a lot of work to to think about what to eat, but it's not something that you change from one day to the other. Very much like you don't go from your couch to a 5K, you can go from, you know, eating without thinking or like to just like having a perfect diet if even such a thing exists. And so I would say, be kind to yourself, you know, like train your sensory system, train your brain, pay attention to what you're eating as much as you can. And maybe one day um, you don't have much time and you'll have, I don't know, like popcorn for lunch and dinner. Like sometimes I have, it's delicious. And you know, it's in a bag. And some other times I have the bandwidth and the time to actually make really nutritious meals. But it starts with like being kind and thinking about the range of possibilities and our leave experiences. Um, and with that, uh, I think we will end this discussion. Uh, thank you all for joining us as we touched on some aspects of the vast messaging network between how our guts and brains interact. Um, I will also reiterate the points uh, to be kind to yourself. Um, relationships with food are not um, easy um, and they're not made, they're not made easy often. Um, <laughs> um, for our next uh, Day on Dialogue uh, panel discussion, uh, we will uh, have a conversation in January uh, on how the brain decides. Um, and so we will be looking at what's behind our decision-making um, and why our brain sometimes calls for misinformation and how algorithms may take advantage of these mechanisms on our various platforms. Um, and so we will be learning about the neuroscience of decision making. Um, I think we have shared the uh, registration for that uh, in the chat. Um, and you will also all receive the registration link uh, of this uh, presentation. Okay. And with that, thank you, everybody. <laughs>